Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Shirley Temple and Herbert Marshall in Kathleen with Francis Gifford. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When I first knew Shirley Temple, she used to come over to my table at lunchtime in the studio restaurant to discuss the state of the world. Her world was concerned mostly with dolls and lollipops. But that was one of the most valued friendships of my life. For with my own grandchildren at home, my main claim to distinction was that I knew Shirley Temple. Well, it's 1943, and Shirley has traded dolls for dates. And since she's become a very lovely young lady, the competition must be rather keen. Tonight, she comes back to the Lux Radio Theater to co-star with Herbert Marshall in their Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer success, Kathleen. A very happy event for all her old friends. And with Shirley and Bart, we have Frances Gifford from the current Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer hit, Cry Havoc. The older generation usually seems rather blind and blundering to the younger generation. And in tonight's play, Shirley undertakes to fix up a certain romantic situation that badly needs fixing. New Year's week is a fitting time to renew old acquaintances. And a proper time for us to renew the resolve that we've made for some years past that the finest plays and pictures of the year will find their places on the schedule of this theater. And that Lux Flakes will continue to present the stars you want to hear each Monday night. If you're a long-standing member of this audience, you're probably also a long-standing Lux customer. If you're new with us, there's no time like a new year to give Lux Flakes the only test that really counts. And using it a very few minutes will cover the whole experiment. And a very few seconds, we'll see the curtain rise now on Kathleen, starring Shirley Temple as Kathleen and Herbert Marshall as John Davis, with Francis Gifford as Angela. <laughs> I have no thoughts to write down for today, so I will just say good night. Good night, dear diary. P.S. I have got one thought. Mrs. Farrell is a meddling old ostrich. The foregoing thought for today was written by Miss Kathleen Davis, age 15. Kathleen lives in the big house on the hill at Davis Estate where for more than a year, she and the housekeeper, Mrs. Farrell, have carried on a constant feud. Now, on a certain Saturday afternoon, Mrs. Farrell kneels on the floor outside of Kathleen's room. There's a sign on the door which says private, but Mrs. Farrell, ignoring the warning, is peering through the keyhole. Kathleen is right. Mrs. Farrell is a meddling old ostrich. Nobody again, weren't you, peeking through my keyhole? You nasty little thing. What do you mean, jerking that door open like that? I might have fallen and hurt myself bad. Badly, not bad. The adverb, Mrs. Farrell, not the adjective. I demand to know what you do every Saturday afternoon. Where do you go? Go ahead and demand. I won't tell. Well, this Saturday you're in for a big surprise. I'll keep my eyes glued to this door. <laughs> They'll look awfully silly. <laughs> now, either you mend your ways, young lady, or I'm going straight to your father. Really? I certainly am. I'm going to tell him that after I've devoted years of my life to caring for his motherless child... Stop calling me a motherless child. My mother died when I was born, and I'm terribly sorry she did. But I can't help it, and I wish you'd please stop reminding me of it. After all my sacrifices... Who's sacrificing anything? You've been getting a perfectly enormous salary. How did you find out about my salary? You've been snooping and spying into my affairs. Oh, no. That's your trick. I just guess. And furthermore, I'm going to tell him that you called me a meddling old ostrich. I never told that to anybody. You've been reading my diary. If you were a nice girl with a nice, clean mind, you wouldn't keep a diary. You get right out of my room. Please, you... You peeping Tom. Dear diary... Looks like I will have to use the laundry shirt to get out of the house this afternoon. I'm going to see Mr. Shoner again. 
You remember my telling you about him? The little old man who runs the second-hand furniture store in the village? He's a simple old soul, but so very kind. And what a relief it is to speak to someone who doesn't treat me like a child. Just a minute, please. Coming. It's all right. It's only me, Mr. Shoner. Oh, hello, Kathleen. Hello. I was afraid it was a customer. <laughs> <laughs> Come in the back and sit down. Shall we have some hot chocolate today, huh? I got cookies. Oh, that's fine. But let me make the chocolate, Mr. Shoner. Sure, sure, my lady of the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, I brought you something. Hey, hey, what's this? It's a fish. Trout. Trout for me? You said last week you liked trout, so I asked my father to catch a nice one for you. Of course, you told me he's a fisherman. Well, that was kind of him to send me this. Hmm. Oh, I told him and my mother all about you. Yeah? Oh, I come here every Saturday and what friends we are. And Daddy said, any friend of my daughter's is a friend of mine. Of course, we don't have much, Mr. Shoner, but he's always glad to share with our friends. Your father, I would like to meet sometime. Yes. Well, I, uh, I'll start the chocolate, shall I? Why, sure, sure. Oh, my, I wish Saturdays would come oftener. Me, too. Oh, tell me, your father, eh, has he been having good luck with the fishing? Oh, yes. His boat got most of the trout yesterday. Here in Long Island Sound? I always thought trout came from the mountain streams. Oh, do they? I mean, do you? I, uh, well, I don't know. Well, anyway, you tell him thank you. Ye yes, I will. Oh, we're running out of sugar. I I'll make a note to get some. Oh, say, uh, uh, that girl in the big house on the hill, your rich friend, how is she getting on? Well, things have been pretty discouraging up there, Mr. Shoner. I'm glad you asked me about her. She's been on my mind a lot lately. She still can't find a way to get out so you can bring her here. No. That Mrs. Farrell watches her like a hawk. It'll never be any different up there. Kathleen, I, I think you're much too young to say never. Old like I am, I don't say it. But how can things get better? Her mother died when she was born. They treat her like a child. Well, she still has her papa. Oh, not really. Seeing him once a week, maybe. Having him say, oh, hello there. That's not really having a father. Not the kind I'd want. Uh, that girl, does she ever try to know her papa? Yes, but it doesn't do any good. Well, it's some people, maybe her father, it's like they are shy. He's not shy. With his friends, he's... He's a regular man about town. Uh, that girl on the hill, has she an imagination? Oh, about like mine. Hmm. Why? Well, if she imagines hard enough how things might be, for a little while anyway, that's how things are. That would take a lot of imagining, Mr. Shoner. Too much. You see, sometimes with me, things aren't so good. The mortgage looks bigger than usual. More and more things in the store get moth bitten. So then what do I do? What? Evenings I sit here. I turn out all the lights. The moon shines only on the nice things I've got, and then I start the music box. I sit, I listen, I look. And soon I'm handsome. I'm rich, even. You know, if you imagine hard enough, there's no more second hand. It's all antiques. Here, give this music box to your friend, will you? Maybe that's the way out of that big, sad house she's always been looking for. Mr. Shoner, I think you must be the kindest man in the world. But I can't take this from you. You just said it helped you. Well, I, I think she needs it more. Listen, how sweet it plays. Yeah. You know, when Mother used to sing me to sleep, her voice was as sweet as that. Sweeter. The sweetest sound I ever heard. She is pretty, your mama, huh? Oh, yes, beautiful. And my father's quite handsome, too. Oh, he's such a darling. Can't seem to do enough for me. You wouldn't believe the way he fusses over me, Mr. Shoner. You know, I think... I think he must love me very much. <laughs> Where are you? I'm right here in my room. Oh. Well, you certainly weren't here a few minutes ago. No, I wasn't, was I, Mrs. Farrell? Where were you? Out. Out where? Just out. 
And how did you know I wasn't in this room a few minutes ago? I locked the door and I put a sign on it. Do not disturb. How did you get in here? Never you mind. For your information, breaking and entering is against the law and very close to burglary. You haven't heard the last of this, young lady. What's that box you've got there? Where'd you get it? It's a box. A very special and important and mysterious little box. And it's not supposed to be opened by anyone but me. So please don't open it. <laughs> no one's going to open it. Good. I just thought I'd warn you, that's all. Don't you speak to me in that tone of voice, young lady. When your father comes home this evening, I'm going to tell him how My you... father? Is he coming home? He certainly is. Tonight? Saturday? Yes. And as soon as he does, I'm going to tell him you sneaked out of the house again. My father's coming home. My father's coming home. I know just how it will be. Jarvis will knock on the door and say, Miss Kathleen, your father wishes to see you in the living room. Thank you, Jarvis, I'll say. Then I'll run down the stairs and... No, I'll walk. Very dignified. Just at first, he won't see me. I'll stand there looking at him. And I'll think how nice and attractive he is. And then I'll say, hello, Father. And he'll say... Oh, hello there. And then I'll say, Father, I'd like to speak to you on a matter of great importance to us both. Very well, but be brief, Captain. You know, my friends are waiting for me at the club, as usual. You have a friend waiting for you here. Who? I'm that friend. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, of course, but you're a... Uh... You're still a child, you know. I'm 15. In this dress, I could pass for older. Yes, that's true. Father, let me read you the poem I wrote for you. It will make everything clear. Oh, very well. Go ahead. It's called, My Heart Cries Out. I don't ask for the moon above. I just ask for your love. You hardly know I'm alive. Yet to win your love, I always strive. You can hear the birds sing. You can hear the bells ring. So please don't be deaf and keep us apart. Listen to the cry of my heart. Well, Father? Dearest, dearest Kathleen, this isn't only a great poem. It teaches me a great lesson. Darling, I've been blind. Not really blind, just... Yes, blind. And deaf to the cry of your heart. Oh, when I realize what I've missed all these years, I, I can't hold you close enough. Oh, it's so wonderful, Father. Kathleen, from now on, we're going to see a lot more of each other. We'll be real pals, shall we? But you have to go to the office every day and out every night. I'll close the office. I'll stay home. Money means nothing to me now. You're all that matters. Oh, Father, it's like a dream come true. Oh, yes? Your father's downstairs, Miss Kathleen. Good evening, Father. Oh, hello, you. How are you? I, I'm very well, Father. Um, hi, what a pretty dress. Getting to be quite a lady of fashion, aren't we? Oh, do you like it, Father? I'm so glad. I, I wore it just for... Come in here a moment, Kathleen. There's someone I want you to meet. Oh. Lorraine, this is Kathleen. Well, here's a young lady I've been waiting to meet for ages. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Bennett? Charming. <laughs> I'm such a goose about remembering things. Your daddy told me how old you are, but I went and forgot. How old are you, dear? I was 15 last April. Oh, my goodness. You'll be a grown-up lady before you know it, won't you? I don't think it will take me by surprise, Miss Bennett. Kathleen. <laughs> I'm a kind of sort of next-door neighbor of yours, spending the summer at the inn. When your daddy goes to his old office, you and I must have some fun, shall we? Yes, I'd enjoy having fun. Thank you. <laughs> What's that piece of paper you're carrying, dear? The latest watercolor portrait of your daddy? No, it is... Let me see, dear. Please, it's just something... Why, what have we here? Not a poem. No, it's nothing. Well, it's a poem, darling. Listen, she has real talent. Please. It's called My Heart Cries Out. I don't ask for the moon above. I just ask for your love. You Give hardly... it to me. Give it to me. Kathleen, what on earth are you thinking about? That was very rude. Well, she had no business reading it. It's private. I think you ought to apologize to Miss Bennett. Then go to your room. Oh, no, darling. No, it was all my fault. But I think I know Kathleen's secret. I think she had a crush on someone. Who is it, dear? Clark Gable or Robert Taylor? I'll go to my room if you don't mind. Kathleen, I don't... What in the world was that? She tried to kill me. Mrs. Farrell, Mrs. Farrell, what happened? She did it deliberately. She hates me. Look at this thing. Look at it. Mrs. Farrell, did I hear a shot? This box. That there was a bomb in it. A bomb in this thing? It exploded right in my hand. She did it. She planted the bomb. Come here, Kathleen. You wicked, nasty let, little... Let, let, let me handle this, please. <laughs> Kathleen, I want an explanation. Well, that's what she gets for snooping into my things. Look, Father, it's printed all over. Personal. Private. Do not touch. 
warning. You see, Father... Never mind about that. But that's the whole point. Was there some sort of gunpowder in this thing? There were merely the insides of some birthday party snappers. No birthday party snappers ever made that much noise. Well, there was a little Fourth of July mixed in, but she had no business... Kathleen, apologize to Mrs. Farrell at once. Father, please. I want you to apologize. You hurt her. In the first place, no one ever got hurt from merely hearing something go pop. And in the second place, it served her right. Oh! <gasps> Kathleen, go to your room. Don't you even want to know my side of it? I know this much. My daughter did a cruel thing, deliberately. I'll decide in the morning what's to be done with you. Now, go to your room. Very well, Father. I don't understand it, Lorraine. I, I always thought they were devoted to each other. Now I find that Kathleen's been bombing Mrs. Farrell, and Farrell thinks that Kathleen... Oh, she she hates the child. What am I going to do? Darling, set your mind at rest. I know just the man. Man? The most wonderful doctor, Dr. Montague Foster. I'll give him the ring in the morning. A doctor? Well, what would I tell him? That Kathleen set fire to the nurse and the nurse hates Kathleen? What could a doctor do? Darling, have him come and give her a thorough examination. Oh, she's healthy enough. Oh, but Johnny, there's obviously something wrong or she wouldn't be planting bombs. M maybe it's a complex or vitamins. Whatever it is, it's beyond me. I tell you, I don't know her at all. She's a complete stranger to me. Oh, but darling, every child's a complete stranger to every grown-up. Now, don't you worry. Maybe she needs vitamin B1. Worst part of it is, Kathleen thinks I'm unfair. She did label that thing private. Maybe I was unfair. <laughs> There's nothing uh, seriously wrong with Kathleen, is there, Doctor? Frankly, there's nothing whatever wrong. You mean not with her diet or anything? No, the difficulty is with the housekeeper. The woman is obviously Kathleen's mental inferior. Well, after last night, I'd agree she was anybody's inferior. Could uh, you suggest anything, Doctor? Yes, I can suggest a sort of uh, companion for Kathleen. A very remarkable woman, Dr. Kent. Dr. A. Martha Kent. She took her doctorate in abnormal psychology. Johnny, that sounds ideal. She's going to South America in the fall. But since Kathleen's going to boarding school in September, perhaps Dr. Kent might take the case for three months. Well, let's get hold of her right away. Dear diary, Mrs. Farrell is leaving tomorrow. She told me they're going to bring in a lady doctor to take care of me. A lady doctor? Mrs. Farrell says she's coming to find out what makes me so much of a problem. Well, from now on, I'll be a real problem. From now on, it's Kathleen Davis against the world. Good evening, Mr. Davis. Good evening, Jarvis. Has uh, Dr. Kent arrived yet? Yes, sir. She's been waiting for you in the library, sir. Oh. Good evening. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh. Good evening. It's quite all right. Uh, 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 you are Dr. Kent? Yes. How do you do, Mr. Davis? Oh, how do you do? You're so much... <laughs> well, I, I expected someone entirely different. What did you expect? Hmm? Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure. Delighted to see you anyway. Uh, sit down, will you? Uh, here, here's a comfortable chair. Thank you. Dr. Foster has told me all about your very wonderful work, and you to be willing to take a job of this kind. You needn't be grateful, Mr. Davis. You're paying me very well. I would like to ask you a few questions about Kathleen. I'm certainly glad to tell you anything. Well, when she goes to bed, does she go to sleep immediately? Hmm? Well, I, I imagine so. Most kids do, don't they? I know I did when I was a kid. Then I know nothing at all about her eating habits, and she's been on sort of a hunger strike today. Hunger strike? Good grief. What would she think of next? <laughs> oh, it's an old device. I used it myself when I was her age. She'll eat when she's hungry enough. Is her principal meal in the middle of the day or at night? Well, you see, I go to the office every day, and I'm not home for lunch. Oh, God. But you do see her at dinner, don't you? No, no. As a matter of fact, I don't. She eats none of her meals with you? Uh, no. No. Oh, not that I wouldn't like it, but you you know how it is. You get delayed at the office. So she has all her meals with Mrs. Um, Mrs. Farrell. I see. Has Kathleen had a basal metabolism in the last two years? Well, I, I honestly don't know. But I, I, I tell you what. You ask Mrs. Farrell. That's the best plan. She knows all her routine and all that. By the way, she's still here? No. She left early this morning. The brief talk I had with her convinced me that she knew nothing at all about Kathleen, except a great many things that aren't so. After the show she put on last night, I'm inclined to agree with you. Awful fool, that woman. 
So maybe you're wiser after all in not knowing anything about Kathleen. Good night, Mr. Davis. When I've worked out a new plan for her, I'll tell you how you can cooperate in it. Oh, well, thank you. Kathleen, I've just been unpacking. Sit down. I only came in for a second. I'm going right back to my room. All right. Uh, there's a room in between yours and mine that connects. I thought I'd better show you where your things go. One side is mine. Of course. I'm glad you came, Kathleen. After seeing the Do Not Disturb sign on your door, I was afraid I'd have to wait until morning to put my things away. Well, I might as well show you now. Oh, fine. Uh, by the way, Kathleen, after this, when you want to be alone... Just close your door, and I'll do the same. That way it'll save us the trouble of putting up signs. You mean, if I feel like being by myself, you won't bother me? Certainly not. I like to be alone, too, once in a while. Oh, well, this desk is mine, and all those shelves on that side, they're uh, rather personal things and not to be touched except with my permission. Good. And which are my shelves? Both. Thank you. I'd better get my books put away right now. Uh, could I... Could I help you? Why, yes. You're not busy. Oh, no. I, I'd love to. Thank you. You've got a lot of books, haven't you? <laughs> Quite a few. This one looks interesting. May I read it sometime? Surely. I I'm very fond of reading. <sighs> Me, too. Why, look. You wrote this book. Uh-huh. A. Martha Kent. What does the A stand for? Oh, a name I don't use. What is it? Well, Angela. But that's a beautiful name. Angela, why don't you use it? It's a lot nicer than Martha. I feel sort of silly being called Angela. I'm not much of an angel. <laughs> it's not silly. Why, it just suits you. I'm going to call you Angela. That is, if you'll let me. You couldn't manage Martha. No. <laughs> All right, then. It's Angela. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Oh, and look, I, I'm sorry about that do not disturb sign. That was for Mrs. Farrell, not for you. You... You can come into my room any time you want. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. You're welcome, Angela. In just a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Shirley Temple, Herbert Marshall, and Francis Gifford in Act Three of Kathleen. Frankly, now, how do you feel when you're washing dishes? Like this? Dishes, dishes, dishes. I could scream. Someday I'm going to throw them all away and use paper ones. Well, why not now? That's a pretty drastic remedy. Here's another one that's easier on the temper, and the dishes, too. Reciting to yourself some poetry you've read. I am drinking in the breeze. I am sailing on the bay. I am cutting snow-white roses. I am down Calcutta way. I am singing in the Argentine. I am dancing in Bombay. While my hands are doing dishes out here in Iowa. Dishwashing time is a wonderful time for letting your fancy run free, building castles in the air. At the same time, if you're using Lux, the dishes are getting done fast. Come clean and sparkling in no time. Besides, those extra gentle suds are so kind, your hands will stay soft and lovely with Lux in the dishpan. Many women have proved what a difference Lux makes. Mrs. Minda Maitland, wife of an aircraft worker, says... Strong soaps made my hands so rough and red, I was ashamed to have anyone see them. Simply changing to Lux took the redness all away. And Mrs. Muriel Doyle, wife of a naval officer, says... George was amazed how my hands improved when I changed from strong soaps to Lux for dishes. They're soft and lovely again. You'll find Lux is thrifty, too. By actual test, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as other well-known soaps. That's important these days when nothing must be wasted. Use all the luck you need to get rich suds, but no more than you need. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Kathleen, starring Shirley Temple as Kathleen and Herbert Marshall as John. 
with Francis Gifford as Angela. Dear diary, Angela is an angel. I like her so much. And I think Father must like her too. Oh, diary, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if... No, that would be asking too much. But there's no harm in trying. I think perhaps I'll go on a campaign to get... Let us pry no further into Kathleen's secrets. Well, another Saturday has rolled around and Kathleen has been visiting Mr. Shona at his store. She used the laundry chute to get out of the house. But on her return, she walked boldly in at the front gate to find Angela watching her from the porch hammock. Oh, hello, Angela. Hello. I, uh, I was out. So I see. What, what have you been doing all afternoon? That's my secret. Oh, I suppose you've been wondering where I've been. No. Oh, by the way, you needn't use the laundry chute anymore, unless it's more fun than the stairs. Oh, thanks. It was getting to be a pretty tight squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> You'd better go and get dressed. We're having dinner with your father. We are? Uh-huh. Well, that's not much to get excited about. Well, Kathleen, what are you talking about? You've told me how much you look forward to seeing him, and all this week you said how nice it was having him home. Well, I do love him, of course, because he's my father. And it says in the Bible you should honor your father. Well, that isn't the reason you love him, because the Bible says so. Well, pretty much. Oh, nonsense. You love him for himself. But there isn't much about him that would make a person love him if he weren't a person's father. Do you think so? Of course I do. Lots of things. For instance? Well, to begin with, he, he's an extremely intelligent man. Well, yes. Yes, I guess, yeah, I guess he is pretty intelligent at that. I uh, wouldn't say he was very good looking, though, would you? Well, I don't know what more you want in the way of good looks. He's, he's tall, he has a good figure, he dresses well, has nice blue eyes, perfect teeth, an unusually attractive voice. What do you want, a collar at? Yes, I see what you mean. <laughs> I guess he's not so bad after all. Kathleen Davis, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That was a good idea of coming up to my room early. It would give them time to get better acquainted. They'll just talk and talk. And after a while, Father will look at her and say, May I sit here beside you, Doctor? And she'll say, Please. Yes. And then, kind of shyly, he'll say, That mean calls you Angel. Yes. I should like to call you Angel, and you must call me John. I love you. John. To think we met but five brief days ago. Yet in that little space, you have crept into my heart. And you and mine, my darling. Kathleen needs the mother's care. And I, oh, Angel, with all my heart, I beg you to be my wife. Angel, will you marry me? Yes, John. Oh, jeepers. Wouldn't that be something? I wonder what he really is saying to her. More coffee, Doctor? No, thank you. Well, Kathleen went to bed very early this evening, didn't she? Well, I'm just as glad. She'll have a big day tomorrow. Tomorrow? What's, uh, what's doing? You and your daughter are going out for the whole day, alone. Well, that sounds fine. I'd like that, but you see, I, I won't be here. I'm driving up to Saybrook tonight. I don't think you should go. Well, but people are expecting me. After all, I, I have dined at home twice this week. Yes, you really deserve a gold star on your report card for a big sacrifice like that. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but... Honestly, Mr. Davis, after 15 years of giving Kathleen only the fringes of your mind and heart, two dinners at home just don't let you out. You know something? You're absolutely right. Tomorrow we take on a picnic. No, you take it. I'll beg off the last minute. You do see some logic in this, don't you? You aren't just playing along with the crack brain. No, I agree with you. In fact, I think you're wonderful. Thank you. It's, as I said before, since Kathleen has no mother... You have to give her even more of yourself than most fathers. Yes. I suppose in a way, it was selfish of me not to marry again. Would it have been better for Kathleen? I know that. I didn't realize it before. I I didn't think of that angle of it. But I do see it now. And pretty soon I may be able to set that right. You're thinking of getting married? 
Well, it all seems to tie in, doesn't it? Well, you're not just planning this for Kathleen's sake, are you? Because that would be all wrong. Psychologically, it'd be completely wrong. Oh, don't, don't worry. I have far too much respect for marriage to, well, to use it to accomplish something. I, I don't mean to pry, but do you plan on being married before Kathleen goes away to school? Oh, it's not as definite as that. I haven't asked her yet. Oh. It's all rather sudden. Oh, I see. I'm the sort of, um, I'm the sort of person who has to be pretty sure of his ground. I don't know whether she'd have me. No, I'll just have to wait and see what develops as time goes on. Watch and pray. Kathleen, come on. Good morning, Father. Morning, dear. Hurry up now. Get your things together. We're going on a picnic. We are? Just the two of us? No, the two of us and the lady. A rather special lady. Oh, I... I know this lady, don't I? You certainly do, and I... I think she's super special. Good for you. You know, you're, you're, you're a very discerning little pigeon, aren't you? I'm 15, Mr. Davis, and I notice a great deal more than you think I do. I bet you do with that. You know, I, I think you and I are going to be very good friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, hello, Kathleen, darling. Isn't it fun about our picnic? Oh, hello, Miss Bennett. Oh, come now. Picnickers can't call each other miss. Call me Lorraine, won't you? Are you... Are you coming? Well, certainly, Donnie. I just told you. Are you going to have hard-boiled eggs, do you suppose, in their shells? What do you think, Kathleen? I really don't know. Or cold chicken. Don't you love to eat cold chicken out of your fingers? Kathleen. Well, you're a funny one, Kathleen. Now that you're face-to-face with Lorraine, you seem to have lost your tongue. And after all the wonderful things you've just said about her. Where? Where's Angela? Why, up upstairs, I imagine. Excuse me. I've got to see her a minute. Kathleen. Excuse me. Angela? Good morning, dear. Angel, you're coming with us, aren't you? On the picnic? No, dear. I have lots of work to do, Aunt. Oh, but I can't go on a picnic with her. Her? Who? Miss Bennett. Oh, I didn't know. Dearest, darling Kathleen, do call me Lorraine. I won't go. Kathleen, if your father has asked a guest... Angel, are you going to let this woman interfere with our plans? We have no plans for today. I mean our plans for you to marry father. Kathleen! Are you going to let her? This is absurd. There was never any such plan. Don't you want to marry him? I've never heard of such nonsense. You said yourself he was good-looking and intelligent. If that's how you feel, then you ought to marry him. Kathleen, I have known your father for one week. Less than a week. Six days. I've known you for six days, and I love you. A friendship like ours is different. Please answer my question. Do you or don't you want to marry my father? Your father and his guests are waiting. Well, I won't have Lorraine for my mother. What makes you think she's going to be your mother? I can tell. He has a kind of light in his eyes when he looks at her. You've been seeing too many movies. Now go on. You're supposed to be here to make me happy. I don't notice you're doing much about it. Now where did you get the idea that my whole function here was to make you happy? Then what are you here for? Kathleen, the sooner you grasp the fact that the world does not revolve around you, the better off you'll be. Your father has his life. I have mine, and Miss Smith, what's the name, has hers. I wouldn't give you a nickel for hers. Will you please stop talking and go get dressed for the picnic? Why? Because I say so. Very well, Angela. My, haven't we had a super scrumptious day? Oh, you've been a grand picnicker, Kathleen. Thank you. I still don't understand why those people didn't put in the salt. Spoiled the whole lunch. Johnny, we voted not to mention the salt again or the milk. Now, just for that, he must pay a forfeit, mustn't he, Kathleen? All right, I deserve it. What shall we make him do? Say the alphabet backwards. Does he have to? Oh, sweet. (laughs) She can't be cross with her daddy even in fun. I know what. To pay a forfeit, we'll make him kiss us both. Oh, that's not a forfeit. That's a privilege. Kathleen, now stop. Dear. I tried, Angel. I tried to be nice all day long, but that woman is poison. Come on, Kathleen, let's bathe your eyes. You ought to see her. You just ought to see her, batting her fake eyelashes at him, gazing up at him like a sick cow. <laughs> Angel, you've got to help me save him. What would you like to wear for dinner tonight? Oh, I, I can't go down there. I, I'll scream. I'm allergic to her. 
All right, you get ready for bed, and I'll go down and explain to your father. Oh, Angela, what can we do? Get into bed, darling. I'll bring you some dinner. Thank you, darling. Thank you. To us, darling. To us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John, it's been such a wonderful, wonderful day. Oh, pretty exciting, I'd say. Oh, oh, come in, Dr. Kent. I'm sorry, I didn't realize... No, please come in. Lorraine, this is Dr. Kent, Miss Bennett. How do you do, Miss Bennett? So this is Kathleen's door, Dr. Kent. I'm so glad to meet you. Thank you. Mr. Davis, the day's been rather strenuous for Kathleen. She's overtired and overexcited, so she's going to bed right away. Oh, I'm sorry. Nothing really serious? Oh, no, she's not ill. Why, the poor lamb. That's strange, though. She was sunny and charming on the picnic, wasn't she, darling? I thought she was. But, um... I understand that you know just all there is to know about adolescence, Dr. Kent. You go from place to place looking after difficult cases. Isn't that it? No, I took my Ph.D. in abnormal psychology in June. But I'll be with Kathleen only until September. Then I'm going on to Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Johnny, that's the place Binky and Helen went on their honeymoon. Uh, Miss Bennett and I have decided to get married in the fall, Dr. Kent. Oh? You see, I've made quite a little headway since our, since our talk together last night. Yes. Oh, congratulations. I hope you'll be very happy. I can't wait to see Kathleen's face when we tell her. Darling, let's go up to her room now. Oh, please don't. She really is quite worn out. Any more excitement would be bad for her. Oh, uh, well, tomorrow, then. I think it would be wise to prepare Kathleen for the news. Well, I imagine she's half guessed it. I gave her a hint this morning about how I felt, and she seemed very pleased. Well, she's very keen about Lorraine. And I still think, though, it would be better not to tell her in so many words until she's grown used to the idea. Whatever you say, Dr. Kent. I really must go now. Good night. Good night, Dr. Good Kent. Good night. Sonny, did you discuss proposing to me with her? Don't you think I should have been the first to know? Oh, it was only in connection with Kathleen, planning Kathleen's future. Oh. Uh, the doctor's a pretty little thing, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she is rather. Very bright, too. Abnormal psychology. Does this sort of give you the creeps? <laughs> <laughs> Angel? Yes, Kathleen. Well, was I right? Do you want some supper? Angel, don't change the subject. What do you think of Miss Lorraine bat your lashes, Bennett? Kathleen, I met Miss Bennett very casually. She's very good looking and she dresses very well. Outside of that, I know nothing about it. Now, would you like some supper? After what I've been through today, the thought of food seconds me. Very well, then. Good night. I bet you ten dollars you don't like her either. Good night, Kathleen. Miss Lorraine Bennett. Money. That's all she's after, I bet. Money. I wish I had a lot of money. I could take care of everything. Oh, if I were only rich. An actress, maybe. On Broadway. I'd know how to handle her. I'd get her to come to my dressing room some night after the show. I'd be taking off my makeup, and she'd walk in the door. You sent for me. I did. Please sit down, Miss Bennett. I'm going to speak very frankly to you, woman to woman. In my opinion, you're only interested in my father's money. How dare you? Don't act, please. Miss Bennett, it so happens that I am now independently wealthy. I'm prepared to offer you the sum of $100,000 to give up my father. You're very shrewd. In my profession, one has to be. Well? I'll take it. Very well. Here. Thank you. Officer, do your duty. This money is marked. Oh! That's Carter. Lorraine Bennett, I arrest you in the name of the law for accepting the sum of $100,000 as a bribe on the promise you would give up one John Stanton Davis forever. Lorraine, no, I overheard all. It isn't true. Is it? Tell me it isn't. No. I mean, yes, it's true. Now you know. No, the sordidness of it. Father, dear, look at me. Forgive me, Father. Oh, my darling Kathleen, you've opened my eyes. I want a wife and you want a mother. And as my wife and as your mother, we want someone lovely looking and intelligent and, uh, and a good sport. In short, someone just like Dr. Arthur. <laughs> hey, Martha Kemp. Oh, John. John, I'm here. If you want me, I'm yours till death do us part. Darling, till death do us part. Oh, what's the good of dreaming? That won't help. Nothing will help. Nothing at all. <laughs> At 
After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will bring Shirley Temple, Herbert Marshall, and Francis Gifford back to the microphone for Act Three of Kathleen. Now we have a real life story for you about 14 year old Marilyn Fisher of Brooklyn, New York. Marilyn's mother, Mrs. Mary Fisher, wrote us A couple of years ago, we joined an ice skating club here in Brooklyn. It was lots of fun, but oh, the costumes, so expensive. I couldn't afford to buy Marilyn the kind the other girls had, so I decided to knit her one. But when it came time to have it cleaned... Oh, Mom, can they have my dress back by Saturday, can they? Oh, you didn't even leave it. Well, I'm sorry, dear, but it just would have cost too much. But I think we can have it spick and span for you by Saturday. We'll lux it. I've always used Lux Flakes for your sweaters and other knit things, so it ought to come out real nice. Oh, let's try it right away. So we did Lux the dress, and it came out beautifully. In fact, I knit Marilyn another one, and we've luxed both dresses ever since. And let me tell you, they're just as pretty now as when I knit them. Lux is so thrifty, too. Every time we lux a dress or a sweater, we drop the money we save in a small bank. And pretty soon, we'll have enough to buy Marilyn a pair of brand new figure skates. Yes, that's a true Lux story. Just one of the many ways in which Lux helps women day after day. Remember the famous Lux promise? Anything safe in water is safe in Lux. That's a promise women know they can depend on. When you stick to Lux flakes, you know your washables are safe. If your dealer is out of Lux, try again soon. More is on the way. Remember, Lux is worth waiting for. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Bart Marshall and I will try to coax a few secrets from Shirley Temple after the play. Now, here's the third act of Kathleen, starring Shirley Temple and Herbert Marshall with Francis Gifford. <laughs> Miss Kathleen Gifford, she seems very sure of herself in the role of Cupid, and she's determined that her father shall marry Angela. Now she's gone to enlist the aid of Mr. Jonah. She wheels her bike up to the store and then stops dead in her tracks. For standing at the curb is a moving van. Mr. Shoner! Watch it, Dan. One side now. Watch it, there. Where's Mr. Shoner? Mr. Shoner! Well, hello, Kathleen. Mr. Shoner, what's happening? You're not moving. Yeah, to Philadelphia. My cousin Frankie died in Philadelphia and left me a place there. With a bigger mortgage even than this. Oh, that's awful. Yeah, well, I'm afraid we won't have any chocolate today. Oh, who cares about that? The awful thing is you're moving. Why didn't you tell me? Well, how can I tell you when you don't come and see me? Mr. Shoner, things have been happening up on the hill. That's why I haven't been down. That's why I came to date, hoping you could help me. Oh, well, of course. Mr. Shoner, this is going to be a shock to you. I, I'm the girl on the hill. No. Yes. Well, well, I thought you were a fisherman's daughter. No, I just said that for fun. I... Oh, it doesn't matter now. Mm -hmm. Look, here's my problem. My father's going to marry a woman I can't stand. I'm crazy about Angela. That's the woman doctor I told you about. And I want her to be my mother. Oh, you do? I most certainly do. Well, this Dr. Angela, has she some feeling for your papa, maybe? Of course she has. But there's some kind of rule about how a woman can't raise a finger to get the man she loves. Isn't it ridiculous? Anyway, Angel won't do anything. And I'm not going to have my father gobbled up by Miss Lorraine Bennett, whom I simply loathe. This Miss Lorraine, maybe she's not so bad as you think. Oh, Mr. Shoner, don't you go back on me, too. I've been thinking and thinking about what to do. All day yesterday, I did nothing but think. And I didn't get any pipe. Now you're leaving. Oh, I'm not leaving for a while yet. And they got to finish the loading. Mr. Shoner? Hmm? If our friendship means anything to you, you can't go and leave me high and dry. You're my last resort. Think of something, Mr. Shoner, please. Well, how about this? You bring your friend, the one you like, around here, and we three of us will have a talk. Maybe we get an idea. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Shoner. You're a tower of strength. <laughs> Kathleen. Jarvis, where's Dr. Kent? I believe she and your father went for a walk. They did? Just the two of them? Yes, Miss Kathleen. I saw them going for the swimming pool. Oh, thank you, Jarvis. You're magnificent, Jarvis. I beg pardon. I really feel quite silly making a conspiracy out of this talk with you. 
talk nonsense. It must be important. Is it about Kathleen? Yes. You see, this is going to be very hard to say. Oh, come on, out with it. Well, to put it bluntly, Kathleen would like to have me with her permanently. Well, what's so absurd about that? I've had the same idea myself. <laughs> but she's been planning... Oh, I'm afraid she's worked out some sort of a campaign to... Well, you see, a girl of that age doesn't realize... Oh, now, look here. Why, why wouldn't this solve everything? Lorraine and I are planning a pretty, lo pretty long wedding trip. And later in the winter, we may go down to Pinehurst for some golf. We'll be away a lot. It'll be dreary for her to come home from school to an empty house. Yes, that would be dreary. So, how about this? You give up that South American business and stay on here. Oh, I know it'll mean a sacrifice for you, but I'd be willing... Do you know what I think of your offer, Mr. Davis? Hmm? Huh? I think it's disgusting. Disgusting? Bringing a child into the world carries some responsibility with it. You've never grasped that fact. Believe me, I feel a great sense of responsibility. Oh, indeed you do. But not enough to alter one single plan of yours. Not enough to make the smallest sacrifice of your, your own pleasure and convenience. Not enough to be more than a bit surprised when you learn that your daughter loathes the woman you're going to marry. Aren't you being a little hysterical? No, I'm not. That magnificent offer of yours makes me so mad I'm telling you the truth. When I asked you to stay on, I was thinking only of Kathleen. Oh, no. You were thinking how dandy it would be to hand your responsibility over to me. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Davis, but I have a life of my own to lead. You can't foist your daughter off on me. You don't want her, that's obvious. Or maybe I don't want her either. And here's one big difference between us. I don't have to have her. She's not my child. She's not... Just a moment. Catherine? <gasps> Catherine, come here, dear. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to listen. I, I was looking for you. Excuse me. Oh, well, Catherine, wait. Catherine. <laughs> Diary. This is the last time I shall ever write in this book. I'm leaving here tonight for Philadelphia. Mr. Shoner will take me in, at least until I can make plans. He's the only friend I have now. The only friend I have in the whole world. Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, Kathleen's run away. Run away? This was in her room, this note. Uh Oh, I'll get the car. No, you'd better call the police. She's had an hour's head start. John, sit down, dear. She'll be all right. There's no use worrying. Why don't they call me? It's been hours, not a word. If you'd only got the car out right away when you wanted to. Why don't we do it now, John? The police want him here where they can reach him, Miss Bennett. She has some money. Suppose she's on a train. Darling, do sit down. You'll exhaust yourself. Uh, by the way, are we quite sure she's run away? Well, there was a note to Angela, to, uh, to Dr. Kent. Oh. Exactly what did she say in the note, Doctor? That she was unhappy. She felt she wasn't wanted. But why should she have felt that? She overheard a conversation between her father and me this evening out in the garden. May I see the note? I gave it to the police. Well, what was it she said? Kathleen was very upset at the thought of her father's remarriage. Well, she couldn't have been. She didn't even know her own mother. She was very fond of me. Why... Why do you say was? But I, I, I didn't mean was. I mean is. Of course I mean is. She is very fond of me. Nobody would have hurt her. Angela, you don't think... I, I, I mean, you do think she is all right, don't you? Of course. Where did you get the idea that she objected to our marriage? She told me. That was the reason for running away. The marriage and my leave. Oh, John, it isn't true. Oh, is it true, all right? Angela, what has she got on the train even before we gave the alarm? She could have got off somewhere along the line before they began to watch. Don't be absurd, John. A young girl alone at night, she'd be noticed right away. Yes, of course, yes. Hello? Yeah? Yeah, you're speaking. Oh, oh, no word. Well, yes, I'll be here. Thank you. Nothing but a sign of her. I'd still like to know the contents of the note she left. You can probably get it from the police. I remember what it said, Lorraine. She told Angela that all she hoped and prayed for would never come true. That you and I were going right ahead and be married. And just what was it she hoped and prayed for? Well, does that matter now? It was something I was going to tell you later on. Well, just the same, I... It all I... seems rather unimportant at this moment. Dr. Kent, I suppose you've discussed all this matter with Kathleen, her dislike for me. Yes. Did it ever occur to you to try to overcome it? Miss Bennett, I can't go into that now. Oh, yes, you can. Very well. Her dislike for you apparently started the first day she met you. And her dislike for me suited you perfectly, didn't it? 
It fitted right in with your plans to reach John through his daughter. Lorraine, be quiet. Don't you see, John? Are you blind? This woman is trying to... I said be quiet. Kathleen is lost. My daughter is lost. For all we know, she may be sick or hurt. I can't quite see that this is any moment for petty arguments, Lorraine. Petty arguments? And if you don't mind, I prefer not to discuss it any further. I should like to go home, please. I can't leave the phone now. You know that. Then I'll drive myself. I'll expect to hear from you in the morning, John. All right, the car's at the door. Thank you. Come on, Joe. Get a move on. We got half a truck pulled on low jet. Okay. Give me a hand with this desk here. Yeah, we get a hurry. Hey, you. hey, look. What's the matter? Holy smoke, there's a girl in there in the back of the truck. We moved her all the way from Long Island. Huh? Well... Good morning. Will you help me down, please? Huh? Is Mr. Shawner here? Mr. Shawner! Yes, Kathleen. Oh, Mr. Shawner. Kathleen, how did you get here? We didn't have nothing to do with it. It ain't our fault. I didn't even know she was in there. No. All the way through to Philadelphia? I had to, Mr. Shawner. I didn't dare take the train, so I hid in the truck last night. Let me stay with you for a while. Please, Mr. Shawner, please. Here, here. You will, won't you? But I... Tell me, your papa don't know where you are all night long? He doesn't care. And don't tell him, Mr. Shoner. If you like me at all, don't tell him. Just let me stay. Come on uh, in the store. I, I just got the room fixed up in the back. Just to rest and, and you'll have some breakfast. I have some money. Tomorrow I'll try to get a job or something. I can manage for myself. Well... Please, promise me you won't tell him, Mr. Shoner. Take it easy. Take it easy. And you go to sleep now and we talk later. <laughs> Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Davis. Who? Shona, I'm afraid I don't. What? Where? Is it about Kathleen? Wait. Hello. Are you sure? Oh, tell me. Is she all right? It's all right, Angela. She's safe. Hello. Give me the address. Philadelphia. Yes, I'm... Oh, she's safe. She's... Oh. Angela. Hello, wait a minute. Angela. some rest? Yes, thank you. That's good. Uh, hey, hey, what's that you got? It's a music box you gave me. It's the only thing I wanted to take from home. Oh, Kathleen, listen. I called your papa. Kathleen, I had to do it. You told him? After I begged you? Please don't be mad at me. Oh, he was awfully worried. You didn't know how worried he was, or you, you wouldn't do this. Why should he be worried? He doesn't care whether I'm alive or dead as long as he has his Lorraine. He'd rather I were dead. Oh, shh. It's true. I asked him, could you stay here with me for a little while till you got happier in your mind, but he said no. He's coming to get me? Yeah. Three hours you finish sleep now. They, they'll be here any minute. They? Father and Lorraine? Well, he said we start right now. Father and Lorraine? Well, I won't go back. I'll run away again. They can't make me... No. Stay. No more run away. I will, though. No, because it is cruel, and my friend is never cruel. She feels for other people, don't you? All right. But it's the same as condemning me to death. You better wash your face. I will go fix something to eat. Father and Lorraine. Why couldn't it be Angela? Just suppose... Just suppose I should be lying here, just like this. And the door should open... And it wasn't Lorraine. Just suppose it was Angel and Father. And they'd come over to the bed. And Father would be kind and understanding. And not angry at all. You'd have more reason to be angry with me. Father. Are you all right, Danny? Father. Oh, if, if this is a dream, it's the realest yet. It's no dream, darling. We're here. Angel. Father. I... I guess it is real. Because if I was making this up... You'd be kissing each other. I think we can take care of that, too. <laughs> you mean Angela and you? I mean Angela and me. And it's very real, darling. Oh, oh! Come on now, sweet. Get your things. The family's going home. The family? Oh, Japer! Our 
Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. The other day, I was buying a newspaper when a girl next to me said, Oh, darn. As she dropped a pen. So she stooped to pick it up. And as she bent her knee, pop went a run in her stocking. Was she mad? To save a penny, she'd ruined a pair of stockings worth over a dollar. But it was her own fault. For only a penny, she could have luxed those stockings four times. And they wouldn't have popped so easily into runs. Yes, strain tests made by a famous laboratory proved that luxing cut down runs by more than 50%. Isn't it worthwhile to cut down runs? Yes, maybe cut them in half by luxing stockings every night. Use Lux Flakes for your stockings. Don't waste Lux, of course. Use all you need to get rich suds, but no more than you need. A little Lux goes so far, it's thrifty, and it saved many and many a penny. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. It's always a very happy moment in this theater when we welcome stars like Shirley Temple, Herbert Marshall, and Francis Gifford back to the footlights after a delightful performance. Naturally, the first thing one says to Shirley these days is... My, how you've grown. Oh, somebody else has said that, too. Yes, and I'll bet they were... They were saying it a few years ago, too, when Mr. DeMell was growing up. Yes, yes, a few years ago. Uh, Shirley, have you ever considered a career in the diplomatic service? No, sir. I'd rather jitterbug. Shirley, I know it's wrong to ask a lady her age, but after all, yours is one of Hollywood's most vital... Oh, well, we'll find another word for that. Would you mind? <laughs> no, I don't mind. I'll be 16 next spring. And, uh, and is it true that, that, well, that you have dates? Yes, but not on school night. And I presume there must be a boy in uniform somewhere that you write to? There certainly is. He's a Marine. If we could get that news first, Bart, Walter Witchell would be green with envy. Would you object to telling us his name, Shirley? Not at all. It's George. And his last name? Temple, of course. He's my brother. <laughs> Maybe you'd be a bigger success as a reporter, C.B., if you'll give us the news on next week's show. I'm glad to, Bart. Because it's the universal picture success, Shadow of a Doubt. And our stars are... William Powell and Teresa Wright. The picture was made by that master of mystery, Alfred Hitchcock. So we'll start the new year with a thriller next Monday night. I like the picture a lot, Mr. DeMille. I want to hear it on the air. Good night. Good night. It was a pleasure to work with you, Shirley. Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy New Year. And a happy new career to you, Shirley. Ladies and gentlemen... Before we meet again in this theater, this year will have joined the past, and a new year become the present. Some of us have had deep sorrow in 1943, but hidden in its days, too, were all the little and almost forgotten things that make living a joy. The passing kindness from a stranger, the bits of everyday humor, the long-awaited letter from a son, the thought of a job well done. They fill the old year to the last minute of the last hour. The diary of the next 366 days is ours to fill as we choose. Some may think they promise only hardship, but there's another way to look at 1944. We have been offered a part in the great adventure, the adventure of deciding the future of the world for a hundred years to come. We are both audience and actors, as the drama comes to its furious finish. And the toast of the times is this. To a new year and to a new world. And now, our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes and Lux Toilet Soap, join me in wishing you a happy and victorious 1944. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Teresa Wright in Shadow of a Doubt. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Kathleen was broadcast through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical As Thousands Cheer. Shirley Temple was heard by arrangement with David O. Selznick. Miss Temple is one of the seven stars of the forthcoming Selznick International picture, Since You Went Away. Herbert Marshall will soon be seen in the MGM picture, Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble. Now, here's news for young women between 17 and 35, 
on how they can get a valuable nursing education absolutely free. America is critically short of nurses, and so the United States government is offering to pay all your expenses in an accredited school of nursing if you qualify. You will wear the uniform of the United States Cadet Nurse Corps. The cost of your tuition, books, board, and room will all be paid.